Okay, the title of my message this morning is Their Sins and Iniquities Will I Remember No More. So, we have Remembrance Day on Monday, and I thought I wasn't going to bring that up, because Jeremy talked about it up here. Oh well, yeah, I was going to do that, but no, I think it was going to preach on something else. I looked at my notes, oh yeah, I was going to preach about remembering. So, but I'm preaching about their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Um, and the reason I'm preaching on Hebrews chapter 10, um, last Sunday, Brother Jeremy and I were out soul winning, and we ran into his pastor, the pastor of Glen Cross Church, and we checked his salvation. That was believe only, but he could reject it. That's why I try to explain to him that he couldn't reject it. But I don't want to, I don't have time to debate you guys, but Hebrews 6 and 10 for starters, and then he basically closed the door. And so I want to, that's why I want to go through Hebrews 10 and also bring up Hebrews 6. Where some people say you can lose your salvation because they don't understand these passages. And if you look at your Bible there, Hebrews 10, verse 26, this, this is where uh, they get this from, starting in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So they're saying, once you sin willfully, then there's, there's nothing you can do about it. You won't help. Well, that's ridiculous. Everybody sins. And are all the sins you do um, not on purpose? I, I don't think so. Did David... Um, uh, commit adultery with Bathsheba, that was just an accident. No, he did it on purpose, right? And, and David's in heaven. His soul is in heaven. His body, of course, is waiting for the day of redemption. So, we, we need to understand what this means. For it says, For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remain no more sacrifice for sin. So, we need to, it's always good idea to get more context, and that's why we read the whole chapter. Uh, but keep going, verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him, what? For we know him that have said, Then he is unto me, I will recompense saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it, isn't it interesting? I just noticed it there. It says, The Lord shall judge his people. People that are his. He will judge. And in uh, what's it? Psalm 11. It says, I just saw him go again. I have to sing the song, but it, the Lord will judge the righteous, right? But him that loveth violence, his soul hated. I'm not quite quoting quote right. He, he's going to judge the righteous, but he hates them that love violence. Okay? And he hates them that hate him, the reprobates. And so this is not talking about somebody that got saved and sin willfully. Like willfully rejected God is kind of like what these people that believe this, this is talking about losing your salvation means. I mean, if you totally reject God, then, then you can lose your salvation. What these people think, okay? And, and that's just not true. So this pastor of this Glen Cross Church is a liar, okay? The liar is an unsaved person. Well, why do I call him a liar? Isn't that a strong word? Well, First John chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. We're going, to be, we're going to be in Hebrews 10 a lot, so if you go anywhere else, just keep your finger there. The first John 5.10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So he's trying to make God a liar, by, by not believing the gospel that, that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this is in his son. This life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So if it was possible that at one point you're going to be 
willfully backsliding, willfully rejecting God, if that was possible, you could you lose your salvation by that. How can you know that you have eternal life? You don't know that because you could something like that could happen to you. You don't know. So what this guy is teaching is totally wrong. And if if people will just get context, and not just cherry pick these verses, and you read the whole passage, read the chapter before, read the chapter after, and then then they would get uh, context because. Hebrew 9, chapter before, Hebrew 9, verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the, to serve the living God? So, the blood of Christ can purge your, 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 your conscience from dead works. And what I believe that means is it'll purge your conscience from, as far as, thinking that you need to do these works to get to heaven. They'll purge you from that and so that you'll know that the only way you get to heaven is by believing on Jesus Christ. So if you're still in Hebrews 10, let's look at verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Not just until you really mess it up bad. Not just until you reject God and say, I hate you. And I don't know, that's kind of a hypothetical thing anyway. I don't know if a Christian would ever say, I hate you, God. I don't know. Maybe it's possible, right? But it says where he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay, them that are sanctified. Who's the ones that are sanctified? We are. The people that are saved are sanctified. How do we know that? Well, look at back up to verse 10. By the which will, will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So we are sanctified if we're saved. So we are sanctified, and if we're sanctified, we're perfected forever. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to sin. It doesn't mean we're per perfect as far as most people think perfect means. It just means there's, there's no way we can go to hell. We're perfected forever. Let's keep reading in verse 15. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and then in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that interesting? Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. It's nice, God, we're sinning, and God's not remembering anymore as far as that making us guilty of hellfire. It says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And then it gets into verse 18 where it says, now remission of these is there's no more offering for sin. Okay, so if you, you just read those verses about we're perfected forever and he's not going to remember our sins and iniquities anymore. And then you, you twist verse 18 to say, no, oh, sorry, not verse 18. 18 isn't the one that, that they like so much. It's uh, verse 26, where it says, There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay, so we see it's forever. You will remember our, our sins and iniquities no more. And then in verse 18, it says, Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So, but here it mentions there's no more offering for sin either. So, what does that mean when there's no more offering for sin? Well, how many times did Jesus Christ have to die? He only had to die once for us. He died for all. He died for people that weren't even born yet, right? And all the sins that they're getting. The ones that aren't even born yet now. Like, everybody's going to sin until everybody has their glorified body. They're, until people have their glorified body, they're going to sin. Having, look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. As if not, we're wondering, can we enter in? We have boldness to enter in because Jesus' blood gave us that, that entry into the, the holiest. By new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance. Does that mean you, you, you got to doubt it? That you're not sure? No, full assurance means we're sure we're going to heaven. Okay. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Notice there's a colon there. 
So that means that's not the end of the thought. And then it goes into verse 25. So it says, let us consider one another to pro provoke unto love and to good works. That means I, I sh iron sharpens iron. Somebody can provoke me to good works and say, hey, you know, have you ever thought of memorizing scripture? Let's say I hadn't thought of that. And, you know, we provoke each other, poke our, each other with a stick kind of. And, hey, um, you remember pray or, or whatever you, like, we provoke each other to good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. That's another way you can provoke, provoke one another, right? Hey, uh, let's see, I haven't seen you in church in a while, or, like, you don't want to make people feel guilty, but, you know, like, provoke them, like, if I miss you guys, or, or something like that. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another so much, the more as you see the day approaching. We see the day approaching. The wicked things that are going on in this, on this world. Now, 26 is the one that they have a problem with. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This is all in the context of verse 24 where it says provoking one another to good works. Okay? So it's our works that are being judged. It's not our soul that's being judged. This is the context of this passage as it pertains to believers. There's another part coming a little bit later. So this is talking about the punishment or chastisement of believers. Okay, we, if we mess up after, after we're saved, let's say I will commit adultery on my wife or, or I would go get drunk. There's, I can't just go kill a bull, put it on the altar, and offer it up to God. Okay, I can't do that. I'm going to get judged by God. I'm going to get chastised. There's, there's, no more, there's no more offering that you can do because we're doing it willfully. Um, we have the law of God in our hearts. And in verse 16 there, I don't think I, I, yeah, I think I did read it. It says, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. We have the law in our heart and in our mind. Okay? And, and notice it says in verse 16, after those days. So back then, if they weren't studying the scripture, even if they're saved, I, okay, I, I shouldn't maybe not speculate. But it says in a future tense that, that they'll put, he'll put the law into their hearts and their minds. So we, we have the Holy Spirit, Spirit dwelling in us. So they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them back then. They, they, the Holy Spirit would come upon them, but they didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we have that nowadays, so we can't just go offer a lamb on the offer or a, a bull on the offer. Uh, sorry, on the altar, when we mess up, when we do it willfully, it says there is no more offering, okay, for that. It says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But that's not as far as going to heaven or to hell. That's about how God's going to punish us on this earth. That doesn't mean he won't necessarily change his mind about punishing us, but... And there's there's no, nothing, no offering we can, can make to, to make that right. Go a couple chapters uh, forward to chapter 12. So we have the law of God in our hearts and in our mind. And this context of this, there being, there remaining no more sacrifice for sins is in regard to ch chastisement and punishment of believers. Hebrews 12, 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So if you're a son, you're going to get chastised, especially if you sin willfully. Like, we deserve chastising if we, we sin willfully. And there, there's no, no, no sacrifice for that. And he does it to the ones he loves, right? The, the unsaved, they get away with a lot of things that we wouldn't get away with, right? Because they're getting their punishment coming to them at one point. But if those unsaved people now become saved through belief, now they're under the same judgment and chastisement where there's no more sacrifice for sins as far as earthly punishment. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? none? But if you be without chastisement, where of all our partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. 
Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So that, that's what I was talking about. If, if, they're, if they're bastards, then this doesn't apply. Then they, they got the hellfire coming. But if they're sons, then this chastisement does apply. Because I'm, I'm not going to go chastise somebody else's son, okay? I don't have the same love for them as I do for my own children. I'm going to chastise my children. That's the same thing with God. He, he loves us and He wants to correct us. And he, he, he knows that if we follow His will and follow His law, things are going to turn out better for us. So there's no more sacrifice to prevent chastening. Uh, let's go back to Hebrews 10, and verse 35. It says in Hebrews 10, 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great re recompense and reward. Isn't it neat how there's words and phrases throughout this chapter that they're trying to use that teach once saved, always saved. Okay? Your confidence. Now, how can you have confidence? Because you know you're saved. There's no if, what, or but about it. You're guaranteed if you believe. The only way that a saved person could go to hell is if what the Bible says is not true. And we know God cannot lie. So there's no way. There's absolutely no way that a saved person could go to hell. So we have confidence. Verse 36. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So patience. It's not wondering. It's not doubt. It's just patience. We've got to, eventually we'll get our, our glorified bodies, but not yet. Not until the day of redemption. Okay, we've got to have some patience. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So we've got to wait that little while. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto the perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And this is where Hebrews 6 actually uh, ties in. So, verse 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, and then there's a colon, and there's a but. And you, you people that actually paid attention in grammar in school. But is what? Is that a conjunction? So, it's it's a continuing thought, but it's, it's, a, it's a contrast here. So, the, the, the saved... The just shall live by faith. The only way we're just is because through faith. Okay? We're not just because we're so good at keeping the commandments. We're just because of Jesus. So we live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So that does, does that mean if a saved person falls into sin, then God won't have any pleasure in him? I don't, I don't think that that's what it's talking about because 39 explains it. This is talking about if any man draw back. So if somebody understands salvation, but no, nah, I don't want that. You're drawing back. And, and it'll make more sense once we turn to Hebrews 6. So we are not, and look at verse 39, contrasts again. There's a, a semicolon. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. So we're not of those that God will have no pleasure in. But then, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So we're not of them who go to perdition, and, but we are of the ones that believe to the saving of the soul. So the people that read this, you've got to think, you've got to rightly divide like the dispensationalists like that verse. And they're not really rightly dividing that verse. Um, you've got to see what is talking about chastisement for believers and what is talking about the unsaved. It's no more offering for sin that's a good chastisement, but if you want to apply it to unsaved people, that only applies once you come and draw back onto perdition in, in verse 39. So let's go to Hebrews 6 so, so we can shed some more light on, on verse 39. Because we are not of them who draw back onto perdition. So Hebrews 6, verse 4. This is also another verse, and this is what I believe he's referring to, where people, where they think people can reject salvation after they've been saved. Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what, is it, what does it mean, tasted? I think I heard somebody put it this way. and said they tasted it, but they didn't swallow it. You know, they, they tasted it means they, they tasted sal salvation as far as they, they heard the gospel message, they understand yeah, that God is the creator, they understand that it's by believing on Jesus Christ as I get to heaven and then they just reject and know I hate God. And once they've tasted that and rejected, knowing full well, okay, and, it, and God knows to what degree they have to understand it and reject it to be reprobates at, at this moment, okay? But if you tasted the word of God and the powers of the world to come, and then you fall away to get them to come unto repentance, in other words, realize they're a sinner and quit trusting in themselves and start trusting in Jesus Christ. It says, um, if they shall fall away to remove them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves to themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shame. And I think I didn't copy enough here. Oh yeah, sorry. No, I did copy enough because verse four. This is all one one uh, passage here. For it is impossible for those. And then you, it keeps going about all these different things. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. So it's impossible once they for sure understand it and tasted of the heavenly gift and they're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Okay, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. That would be so sad. You understand salvation, and you see how easy it is, and you reject it. It's impossible. Now, we we sometimes explain the gospel to people, and it seems like they get it, but they don't choose to pray. Now, I'm not saying those people are going to turn into reprobates, because there might be a nagging question that they're not asking us, so that they don't really understand it. But if somebody actually 100% understands it, what what I believe this teaches is they tasted the heavenly gift and they're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They tasted the Word of God and the powers of the world to come. It's impossible to renew them again unto repentance if they fall away. If, if they stay there but they just don't accept it quite yet, they're not quite 100% sure, that doesn't mean then they haven't fallen away. They're just not quite there yet. But if they do fall away, they totally reject it. And, and I've heard stories of this. You know, people kind of get interested in church and get interested in salvation. And then all of a sudden they understand it, they reject it, they got worse than they ever were before. And it's impossible. And turn to Romans 1. Romans 1 talks about this. Romans 1 and Hebrews 6, in this passage, they, they, they go together. Romans chapter 1, in verse 18. I'll turn there to Romans chapter 1. Okay, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Think about that phrase there. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's not that they don't have the truth. They hold it in unrighteousness. They know what the truth is. They chose not to accept it. It's not that they didn't know. They knew. They just chose not to accept it. It's, these are people that tasted of the heavenly gift. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Not, not fuzzy. Not, not yeah, I don't know if there's a creator. It's clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as an eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And I think we're all familiar with the, the, the reprobates and the vile things that talks about them doing in uh, Romans 1. But they... They knew God, but they glorified not as God. They were, they 
had tasted of the heavenly gift, they tasted the good word of God, they are made partakers of the Holy Ghost, but they fell away and it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. So Romans 1 and Hebrews 6 are talking about the same kind of people. Reprobates. They, they can not get saved. It's impossible. And actually, we were just, and actually I think I'll flip there. In, uh, we were just going through the book of John on Thursdays. In John chapter 7, Jesus taught the reprobate doctrine. And I mean, the, the whole Bible is the word of God. Let's see if I can find it here. In John chapter 7. Okay, verse, thir starting verse 33, John chapter 7. This wasn't in my notes here, but. And then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. This, so what was Jesus talking about? Jesus was going to heaven. And he's saying, it's impossible for them to come there. And why? Back up to verse 20. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. They, they said that Jesus had a devil. That's calling the Holy Spirit a devil. That's blasphemy. Blasphemy the Holy Ghost, that's something that makes a person a reprobate. So Jesus taught the reprobate doctrine also. It's, it's not just Romans 1 in the New Testament. There, there's other places as well. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. If they taste. This is not talking about a Christian in Hebrews 6 or 10 where it's talking about um, drawing, drawing back into perdition um, or where it's also talking about falling away and being impossible to renew them again unto repentance. It's not talking about somebody that got saved and then became unsaved. It's talking about somebody that holds the truth in unrighteousness. Let's go to a few chapters uh, forwards to chapter 4, Romans 4. I think, we're, I think a lot of us are pretty familiar with Romans chapter 4, at least this passage here, because we like to use this as soul winning, Romans 4 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And that's, for me at least, that's the most popular verse, but you can do the next three verses as well. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. So we don't have to do any good works. God's already imputing righteousness, putting that on our scorecard, as it were, that this guy's righteous. Not because I'm doing good. It's because I believe in Jesus Christ and my faith is counted for righteousness. So David's talking about this. He's saying, Bless, he's described as the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So he's not saying they're without sin, like these sinless perfection people want to say that once you are saved, you don't sin anymore. But that they're covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So if you're saved, God will not even count it to your scorecard. Okay? Because he already put it on Jesus' scorecard way back before Jesus died. Or I should, like, not way before Jesus died, but way back when Jesus died. When he was hanging on the cross. He had all, of, all the sins of the people that ever will get saved. And guess what? He didn't have, just have all the sins of all the people that will get saved. He had the ones of the people that won't get saved. Okay? So he had everybody's sin on there. But it doesn't... It, you don't get to take it off your scorecard until you believe. Okay, we'll stay in Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. 
And that sounds very familiar to what we were reading. I think it was Hebrews 10. Oh yeah, Hebrews 10, verse 36. For ye have need of patience, or actually, sorry, verse 3, but cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So, so in Romans 8 it says, but if we hope for that, we see not that we do with patience wait for it. We're not hoping, we're not doubting, we're just patiently waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Okay? Our soul is already saved, Jesus is already made a mansion in his house, in God's house for us. But our, we still have our flesh. The one day that we're going to get rid of this flesh and it's going to be transformed into a, a glorified body. Um, let's keep reading in Romans 8. Let me skip some of this. Let's uh, drop down to verse 32. Actually, 31. What shall we say then? What shall we then say for these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Who also make an intercession for us. I guess the one these people just glaze over that verse. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? He's asking, who's going to separate us from the love that Christ has for us? We're, we're saved people. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Me and all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So all these things through tribulation we're more than conquer. Distress, we're more than a conqueror. Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us, through Jesus Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there anything in this world, whether it's spiritual or physical, that does not fall in this list of 38 and 39? Everything in the world falls under this list. So if nothing in this list, in this world, or the world to come, can separate us from the love of Christ. How can we ourselves separate us from the love of Christ by drawing back into perdition like these guys, you guys want to say? Okay? Or that we tasted the heavenly gift but we've fallen away. That's not talking about saved people because if, if, if that actually applied to saved people, then this would be false here, 38 and 39. Because death isn't going to separate you from the love of Christ. Life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, things present or things to come. Well, guess what? We're living in the present. We're, we're a thing that's in, in the present. So we ourselves cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Nor height, nor death, nor any other creature which shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. People that go to hell, do you think God still loves them at that point when they go to hell? If he loved them, why would he let them go to hell? He loved them at one point, right? For God so loved the world, like he, that's past tense, he loved them, that he gave his only begotten Son, that who served or believeth in him, should not perish, like go to hell, but have everlasting life, right? So God loved everybody at one point that they, that they should believe and, and, and not perish. But once you have believed, you have everlasting life, and man, if you have doubts about your salvation, just turn to something like 
this verse here, Romans 8.38 and 8.39, very cool, like John 10.28, where it says, actually, let's just quickly flip there. Romans is close to John. John 10, 28. Actually, starting verse 27. 26, how about it? 26, but ye believe not because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Okay, so he's telling the Jews they're not of, of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Okay, never. Not even if they, whatever, if they so-called fall into a Hebrews 10 or Hebrews 6 scenario, which isn't even talking with them, but if, if you thought it was, right? It says they will never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Guess what? If, if, if something you do plucks you out of God's hand, well, you're, you're a man too. A man is in mankind. You know, what this applies to women too. So no man can pluck them out of, out of Jesus' hand. And then, it's, and then it says in verse 29, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he makes it double secure. Like, you, nobody can pull, pull you out of my hand, and nobody can pull you out of my Father's hand. It's greater than all, right? So, and then of course they wanted to stone him, because he said him and the Father were one. So, and this is a pastor... That's sit that's supposedly read the Bible. And if he ever if he reads it in the King James Version, I don't, I doubt it. Obviously not saved because he gave the wrong answer. Because if he was saved, he would understand. That when we come to these hard passages, okay, uh, or was it that other one that the people like to use about burning the branches? I, I forget um, where that one is. Maybe it's on Hebrews 15. Is it? Matthew, maybe? Yeah. Anyway, we were talking about burning the branches, and I've talked about that before. When you have an unclear passage, who do a very clear black and white passage like Romans 8, 38, 8, 39, and then you can think of, okay, what are the scenarios that I, like me personally, if I think, okay, how can I lose my salvation? Well, I'm not sure about this one thing. And then you read here, well, does that one thing fall under these categories? Yeah, it does. Is, and then you think, well, is there anything that wouldn't fall under these categories? And then, no. There's no, no way that you can be separated from the love of God. Well, well you can't be, God still loves you, but you can, you can reject Him. No. You, you, you fall under these categories. In, in Mark 3.35, I'll just... Here's another one of these passages that somebody might want to twist. It says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. So you've got to do works. No, you don't. John 6, 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay? So what's the will of God? That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. So Romans 6 and Romans 10, he didn't have time to, to, to debate me. Well, I don't even want to debate. Why are these people always full of debate like these people like James White? Discuss? Yeah, I'll discuss it with you, but I don't want to debate you. But if, if, if after the first and second admonition somebody doesn't, doesn't accept it, we move on. Because we don't want to get into arguments with people. It's useless. Especially somebody that's a pastor that thinks they know everything already. Like, uh... You told me about that verse last time, but um, something about a, a fool is 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 wiser in his wisdom, or something more than ten men that can render a reason. This is, I'm, I'm butchering that verse, but when you get to somebody that's so terribly prideful, you know, I went to Bible college, I went to seminary, I'm the pastor of this huge church or a small church, whatever it is, and they, they can't even discuss salvation with you. Just imagine if somebody came to to pick the godly pastor's door and they're, they're trying to preach the Bible to them and are you, are you going to be prideful? No, this is your opportunity to find out if they're saved and if they're not saved well then you can explain it to them. Why, why are you going to be too prideful to even talk to somebody about the Bible? Like, I don't care who you are, you can always learn something from somebody and 
from anybody. From some people, the only thing you can learn is what not to do. But you can, you can learn something from everybody. And you should never get that prideful. But I, I just figured I'd, I'd preach on Hebrews 10 and, and 6 just because we get that, that uh, question at the door or, or that, you know, that's the reason why people, they think people can lose their salvation and then you have an idea. Like, I, I just, you know, preaching this sermon, it's like, hey, I think maybe next time I should go to Romans 8, 38 and 39 when I'm so late. Like, which one of these things that you said that you could lose your salvation if you did, which one of those things falls in this list? Well, they fall in, all fall in that list. So that nothing would separate you from the love of God. Let's pray.